Well, uh, friends, we are in the book of Ephesians, and as we're kind of cranking away here, um, really getting into the heart of what Paul was writing, we find ourselves in Ephesians 2 today. Now, last week we talked about um, the very uplifting uh, first part of this little three-part mini-series within the book of Ephesians. Remember I said last week, we'll start with children of wrath, then we'll move on to being redeemed in Christ or, or saved by grace, and then redeemed for his purposes. Um, so last week was children of wrath, and we talked about some things that, um, that we have to wrestle with. And I, and I ask you, go out and look at this world with open, honest eyes. See what's breaking the world, the sinful heredity, and see what you're doing to cause brokenness in it. Um, it, was, it was a little bit rough. But if you remember the God chart, the good person chart where you had a holy God up here, and then this line of sin and then this kind of vertical line, and below it was like the worst person on earth was uh, Adolf Hitler. The next worst person, or the best person, maybe Mother Teresa, maybe Billy Graham way up here. But Billy Graham had the same crisis Adolf Hitler had. What do you do about the space between a holy God and you? There's no good person that's getting into heaven, right? There's just no good people going to heaven. They're sinners saved by Jesus Christ, but there's no good people. And we had to talk about the gap. But here's what I love about this sermon and this part of the teaching is in order to fully understand the goodness of this, you have to have a week like last week. Who here ever saw the movie Finding Nemo? Anybody? Great little clownfish with a broken wing or flipper or whatever it was. Um, but there's little Nemo. Remember when he and his friends go out to the drop-off? And they go out to the drop-off, and they're looking at it, and they see that boat bobbing around out there, right? And they're like, what is that? And his friend's like, it's a butt. Remember? Yeah, I love that part. And um, not because I said butt and I'm an emotional nine-year-old, but um, I kind of am. But uh, even still, what I love about that is there's this thing out there that's so attractive to them, but it's a great risk to get there. And, and Nemo is told, you can't get there. You can't get there. You can't do these things, Nemo. And when, when Marlon, his dad's arguing with Mr. Ray about something, um, sad how well I know the characters, um, Nemo swims out. Remember? And he gets right underneath the boat. And his dad's like, you get back here, mister. Right now, you swim over here. And he's like, Badoop. And he's like, oh, don't you touch that. And he's like, that, oh, how dare you get back here now, sir. And, you know, Nemo starts swimming back to his dad. But here's the thing. Paul gave us a butt, something to reach out and grab onto. But I'll be honest, it's not for the cowardly. It's not for the dishonest. It's for the courageous who are willing to swim out to a place that admits your own depravity, your own brokenness, and invites you to grab on to this little phrase that says, after we find out we're children of wrath, dead in our transgressions, but because of his great love for us and God being rich in mercy, that's a but like Nemo, you reach out and you kind of oh, hold on to, right? But because of his great love for us, God, in his mercy, did not for us see fit to be a part. So this is how Paul says it. He made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Just, just think about this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. That which was dead, he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let's just dispel a few myths. You do not see the kindness of God in the sunrise. You don't see it from a tree stand. You don't see it from a fishing boat. You don't see it if your team wins the NFL championship. You don't see it if you get the number one post on Pinterest. You don't see the kindness of God anywhere 
but in the grace expressed through Christ. The kindness of God is revealed in Christ. Don't ever as a church be deceived to think that you can find the kindness of God in a good day. You find it only in the person of Jesus Christ, which means if you want to be close to the kindness of God, you walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is a tough kind of scripture for us to hold on to as as Americans, as, as people. It's not Americans, it's been like universal since Paul wrote these words. It's hard to hold on to that we are saved by grace through faith, and it is not from us. It is not our grace extended to ourselves. But our faith is in Jesus Christ, so it's not of us. But we have been saved by grace through faith because it was a gift of God, not by us, so that we would never boast about it. We would simply receive it. It's an important reality to understand where Jesus found us. So we're going to use two places today in Scripture to name where Jesus Christ found us. He didn't, we didn't necessarily run to God. He found us. He sought us out while we were in sin and found us. The first place he found us reminds me of a story about a woman and a mob. I don't know if you've ever seen a mob, and I'm not talking like, you know, like 1920s Al Capone, but I'm talking about a mob of people walking down a street, a large mass of people that looks unruly and unkept, and you want to get away from them because everything about their energy and their approach speaks anarchy, okay? I want you to think with me what this felt like today. And what we're going to talk about comes out of John chapter 8, 1 to 11. I'm not going to read the text. I'm going to tell it to you as a story so you and I can get a picture of it. You know when you're like in Florida on spring break and you wake up early because you're a morning person and I have nothing to do with you? Little side text. Um, not a morning person. Um, but, but you wake up early and, and you go out. It's dark. The sky turns kind of a, a silvery steel color. And then up an orange burst in the, in the eastern horizon. The sun rises. And that first kind of hint of daylight kind of warms the air immediately. And you're like, oh, the sun's coming up. It's warm, it's kind of beautiful, and it's early morning. Only the morning people are out, and they all say hi to each other as they walk by. Morning, and you're like, stop being happy, it's the morning, you know. But they've got their coffee and maybe a little dog with them, and they're so happy, right? I want you to picture a sun-kissed, bright, clear morning just starting to warm up just a little bit. And there stands Jesus Christ on the Temple Mount, And an angry mob is moving towards him. And the mob comes up, and they were kind of frog walking someone with them. And it's a woman whose robe she keeps trying to close because she's trying not to be indecent. She's closing a robe, her head's down, and they're dragging her there. And they push her towards Jesus. So it's her and Jesus. And they look at him and say, teacher. This is the Pharisees in all their perfect religious garb. They look so good at being right and knowing God better than we do. And they go up and they push this woman towards Jesus and they say, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. They took her out of a bed of a man who wasn't her husband and brought her from that bedroom to this temple mount. And they pushed her in front of him and said, The law of Moses says we should stone her. And at that moment, you kind of notice on this beautiful sun-kissed morning that the men are standing there with fist-sized rocks in their hands. And they've got these kind of ice-cold, loveless eyes that are waiting for the opportunity to bury said rock into said woman for her sin. They are going to be the very judgment of God on her. And Jesus Christ, standing there, hears them say, Teacher, The law of Moses says this woman caught in adultery should be stoned to death. What do you say? I mean, he's got to be like, dude, it's 7 a.m. Can I at least have, like, I'd be like, can we schedule this for noon when I have my, no. I love this. Jesus ignores them. He ignores them. Like, what what do you say? He kind of haunches up his robes. He squats down. And he starts drawing in the sand. Have you ever been ignored by one of your kids or somebody who's supposed to be 
in submission. You, I, don't you ignore me. I am in charge here. And you get super angry and shaky. How dare you ignore me? And Jesus just writes in the sand. Then he stands up and he asks them a question. Or he makes a statement. Okay. You're right. She is guilty under the law. So you who have no sin, you go first. Who's up? And what's interesting is the text goes to great lengths to point out that the oldest man was like, thump, I'm out. 72 years of desperate hidden sin. I'm a broken man. And he just walks off. Finally, the young zealot who's standing there is like, oh, but she's caught in it. I'm not, thump, and walks off too. Till Jesus stands alone with a woman who can't even look up. She's probably a crumpled mess on the ground. And he pulls her up and he says to her, woman, where are your accusers? Do you have any accusers? And she said, no, sir, there are none. And he says, then neither do I accuse you. Go and leave behind your life of sin. That's where Christ found us. Make no mistake that you and I are the woman. And you're like, hey, I've never done that. Well, you've probably done worse than hidden. So have I. We have lived in our hidden sin, and all that's kept us from her shame is public knowledge of who we are. But here's where the words of Paul grab on deeply. See, this story tells us the heredity of sin is also something we choose. But Paul goes on to say, over this circumstance, you've got to remember, this happened in Jesus' life, and Paul's writing shortly after the life of Christ, and he's saying, by grace you have been saved through faith. If God found us in such a lowly state of sin, what does it mean that by grace you have been saved through faith? I say this all the time. I don't think there's another phrase that comes out of my mouth off the pulpit more than this. Because I believe it. Because it has to be true for me and for you. Because I can't do it. I can't make the leap to God. I'm not good enough. I'm too broken. By grace you have been saved through faith. What does that mean? Let's talk about what it means. What is grace? Grace is undeserved favor or kindness. Undeserved. We are so quick to be self-righteous in how much good we can do for God's kingdom, lest we forget that everything we are was an undeserved gift of kindness and favor from God. By grace, you have been saved through faith. By the kindness and undeserved favor of God, you and I sit here in the hope of salvation today. But then you say, okay, that's what it is, but what does it look like? What does grace look like in real time? I mean, I like the story of the woman, and Jesus shows her grace there, but what does it look like? And how has God been showing grace? I love family traits. I love traits you can trace back in your family line. Jesus had a great 29 times over grandpa named King David. And King, King David was the originating um, member of the Davidic dynasty that would rule over the tribes of Israel and then Judah and Benjamin. David was not the first dynasty in the kingdom of Israel, though. There was one immediately before him, and his name was King Saul. Saul and his son, who was David's best friend, Jonathan, were killed in battle. David, through a series of events, he was king. God had anointed him king over Israel. David was king. And in the ancient world, kings annihilate the bloodline of the former dynasty because that bloodline has claim and title to his throne, right? That's just legal right. David has every right to do this because he's king. And he asked the question in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David asked the question, are there any members of Saul fa Saul's family still living? To which the captain of the guard's like, oh, we get to get our swords dirty today. That's not a question that's positive. And nobody really answers. And he says, is there anybody in Saul's family yet living that I may show kindness to? Okay. <laughs> kindness. You know, relieving them of their earthly burden or their physical head. You know, those kinds of kindness. Like, I want to help, you know, lift the load and take it off. That's, the, you know, you would kind of, you have to be thinking 
they're not like, what a noble king. They're thinking, oh, this poor guy. Yeah, David, there's one. There's one. His name's Mephibosheth. How do you shorten that up? Hey, you know, I mean, that's just not an easy name to shorten up, is it? But there's Mephibosheth. That's his name. Here's the story of Mephibosheth. He was born in the line of Saul. And when it was said that Saul and Jonathan had died, uh, one of his nursemaids picked him up and ran out of, the, out of the palace with him and fell on the stairs falling on him and broke his legs. There were no, or, no orthopedic surgeons back then, so he grew up with great uh, brokenness in his legs and deformities and was never able to walk. And they said, yes, there is Mephibosheth. And David said, bring him to me. I'm like, man, he's no threat to you, David. Come on. He brings him in. And David falls towards him and loves him. The one he should execute because Mephibosheth has claim to the dynastic throne, David loves. And he not only loves him, he proves it in a, in a just a beautiful display of undeserved favor and kindness. David said, you will be as my son. You will sit at my table. You will eat with me and my family and my children, and you will never be far from here. You are one of us. He who deserved death by law was given freedom and life, and not only just a life, he was given life in the king's court. He was given a hope, but then he was given a reality where he could speak into the king's ear, and even if he had a passion for something, I am sure direct policy. Mephibosheth was shown unbounded favor, undeserving kindness. What does it look like? It looks like somebody who had the wrong heredity, the wrong gene, the wrong bloodline, and physical brokenness that said you're not worth anything. And David said you're worth everything because I loved you. I loved your brother, Jonathan. I loved your father. And you are part of us. That is what grace looks like. When those who deserve death are shown not only favor to live, but given a life and life more abundantly. But what we have to do is unpack real quickly that we need to understand us like Mephibosheth and us like the woman caught in adultery. This is not of us what's about to happen in grace. Paul says, this is not from yourselves. Don't pat yourself on the back and be like, I did it. I found Jesus. No, no, no. Jesus found you. And by the grace of God, through your faith, you have been called into him, into life in him. This is not from you. This is not from me. How dare we think that the gospel is something we find when it's been God who's been seeking us out and calling us back. We need to understand That for you and I, we often miss the boat when we think this is ours, that we created it. We somehow are responsible for the grace we're living in. We're not. So I'll tell you this. If you want a pastor who has it from himself to be saved, you've got to probably just grab a cup of coffee on your way out. And you don't ever have to talk to me again because I'm not him. I am a pretty, I'm working out my, my salvation with fear and trembling. I'm not gracious to people around me sometimes. Erica and I went to a pastor's conference this past week, and um, we suffered in San Diego for a few days. What up? And, um, oh, it's so warm. It's my hometown. I was like, I'm going to freeze to death. Um, but we're, we're walking into this place in Balboa Park, and about a number of guys, they, they took notice of my bride, and they're like, whoa, hey, whoa. And I didn't handle it well. I mean, I, you know, you see somebody pretty, whatever, like, oh, hey, oh, and they like turn, and like, they look, and I'm like, seriously? Seriously. And Eric's like, please don't yell at people in public. And I'm just like, who, do you, like, I'm like, who do you think you are? All you bunch of ruffians. I don't like you. You know what? <laughs> I will take him and beat you, him with you. I'll just use you as a bat. I didn't like him. I don't think they deserve love, friendship, and they definitely didn't deserve to be near my bride. I had no grace for them. And Eric's like, please stop yelling at people in public. I'm like, then they can be polite and respectful. I don't dig this, and it makes me super mad. Right? I had no grace for people. No grace. Cut me off in traffic, same thing. There's different areas where I don't display grace, and God's working it out in me. 
because I know this is not from me. It doesn't come naturally. What comes up out of me is kind of ugly at times. And it reduces people's worth in Christ and makes them some kind of byproduct that makes me mad. This is not from me. I'm not teaching you about grace. Paul is. And Paul's not teaching you about grace. The Holy Spirit is trying to tell you this is not something you did. It is a free gift from God to you so that none could boast. This is the work of Christ brought to completion in you. The work of Christ come full in your life. We need to understand that we are saved only, only, only by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you're sitting in here going, okay, I've heard the gospel before. Let me just tell you, you may hear the gospel all the time. And you think, I I already asked God to forgive me and I'm done. I think Christians should be people who understand confession and confess often and lay before God that which breaks his heart and ours. We need to understand that it's only in Christ we're saved. So no good deed can offset a bad deed. Only giving it to Christ. I invite you to be people who understand that only in Christ do we find salvation. So only in Christ should we return continually to find out who we are. Because in him we have our identity. We must remember that we have a heredity, a bloodline of sin. That we as individuals couldn't close the gap. I don't care if you're Billy Graham or Mother Teresa. The leap was too great to you getting to God. But as Paul said, but thanks be to God. But thanks be to God for his love and his mercy to us. See, we understand that we couldn't close the gap, which calls us to a point where we need to understand and apply this in how we live. And we need to answer the question, what does grace mean for the rest of my life? If I come to Christ and I return to him often in confession, what does it mean for the rest of my life to be in Christ, in the grace of God? I'm going to say something that, that might shock some of you. But there are people sitting in this room who have gone to church their whole life and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never asked him to become your Lord and Savior. You've never confessed your sin and laid it all out before him and you are no more a Christian than that door on that wall. Being here doesn't save you. He does. Your only participation is to do this. Receive the free gift of grace in Christ Jesus. That is all you can do. So forgive me in this bluntness, but you're the woman caught in sin. I'm the woman caught in sin. Your broken and wrong bloodline Mephibosheth, and I am of the wrong bloodline, and I'm broken and worthless Mephibosheth. We are both of them. We own the heredity and the willful sin. Notice that. Mephibosheth was just of the wrong line and suffered an accident he had no part in. But he was equally in need of grace, as was the woman who willfully went out with another man and cheated on her husband. Willful sin and bloodline heredity. It doesn't change the fact that they both need grace. We are both. So what we have to do is understand that we are saved by grace through faith. And that means we have to first receive the free gift of grace. We have to receive the undeserved favor and kindness of God to be redeemed in Jesus Christ. And in receiving grace, your life changes its state. Think of ice going into liquid water. It's a different state for the same substance. Your life becomes something totally different when you receive the grace of God. You become a living reflection of the grace you received because suddenly you know salvation wasn't up to you. It was handled by Christ and you allowed him not only to find you, but to redeem you. And you invited him in. You become a living reflection or embodiment of the grace that you've received. The next thing we have to do is understand that we have to give the grace we've received. It's not just receiving. You can't just take and take and take. We have to give the grace that we've received. And the reality for you and I is that our natural desire is lame, it's judgmental, 
and it's self-righteous, right? You see a new Christian, and they just love Jesus. I love him so much. I'd do anything. I'll go to Morocco, and it's just great, and I love him. Two years later, they're like, that person's in sin, and you're like, oh, crusty bad. You know, you want to knock that off and kind of get it back down to this raw, honest Christian who knew Jesus, right? We are kind of lame. We're pretty judgmental, and we're crazy self-righteous because I have it together, and you should, right? You should follow me kind of mentality. That's why I say to you, don't, don't follow me. Follow Jesus. Walk closely with Jesus. Know the one who is the author and perfecter of your faith and my faith. That's who I'm following. We need to understand that to give the grace we've received, we have to first name our own natural state. And we are judgmental. We are self-righteous. And Jesus speaks to this crazy paradox of someone saved by grace but also not allowing transformation to happen. In uh, Matthew chapter 18, there's a story that Jesus tells. He told a parable, and it's a parable of the debt collector. And this guy comes into the, we'll say the king. Jesus used certain language, but, um, and I'm going to use our dollar figures. I'm not going to try to equal them all out. So uh, Jesus tells the story of this guy who comes in to the king. The king is calling in all his debts. He wants all his debts paid. This guy comes in. He is a low-level day worker. He doesn't make much money, and he owes the king $500,000. And the king says, it's time to pay up. And he says, I've not been good with what you gave me. I've, I mean, I don't have any yet, but, but please, I'm sorry. And the king says, take him, his wife, and his children, and sell them to recoup my losses. He falls at the king's feet, and he begs him, please, master, give me a chance. I will pay you back every penny. Please don't sell us off. Can you imagine a dad or a mom seeing their husband and their children sold into slavery to pay debts? And the king takes pity on this man and says, okay, you know what? Clean slate. You go from here. And you go live freely with that family you love so much. Can you imagine the weight the kid get up here and be like, no way. I don't have to pay it back. Oh, my gosh. He walks out of the king's palace into the courtyard free as a bird. He looks across the courtyard, and he sees a guy who owes him 100 bucks. You know, hey, Bill, come here. You owe me 100 bucks. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I can't pay you right now. Oh, he grabs him by the throat. In Jesus' story, it says he chokes me. Harry, your hands are freezing, right? He's got him by the throat, and he's choking me. He's like, pay me every dime. And he says, I can't right now. I will pay you back. And he said, no, no, you owe me. And he grabbed him by the throat. He drug him and threw him to the jailers, and he said, imprison him till he pays me every penny. But the king's servants were watching and thought, isn't this the man who was just forgiven 500000 So they told the king, And the king brings him in and says, you wicked, evil man. Were you not forgiven ten times as much as this? Weren't you begging for forgiveness in time and yet you given a clean slate? You wouldn't even give him time. So here's what I'll do. I will take you and I will not only put you in jail, but I will hand you over to the tormentors. Those weird people in dark dungeons who love to do mean things. That's where you're going. And you will suffer and repay every penny with your blood, sweat, and tears. That's a story Jesus told, which tells me this. We better get off our high horse and start giving grace as freely as we received it. We better start looking at people differently and valuing them in the way that Jesus does. And he saw them worth dying for. We better become the living embodiment of grace so that our life tells a story. And you may think, I don't know how to do that. Here's the deal. Quit being your worst. Start living to be his best. Be the grace you were given. Finally, grace is transformational. Grace is transformational. You may think, Eric, I can't change this. It's actually not up to you. The Holy Spirit will come into your life and change you. Live the transformation. Mephibosheth, a product of a broken heredity and bloodline. A woman caught in adultery, a product of willful sin. And Christ changed her life and said, go and leave your life of sin. 
She had no accusers left. Mephibosheth was given a place at the king's table. And what it tells us is this. We are invited into a new family. And in our family, well, now you're part of a family system that makes the unchangeable move in the right direction. It makes the impossible traits to let go of, well, unbound from you, and you can become like him who you love. We are no longer bound to our identity. We are called but to one thing, for us to become more like Christ. And the only way we can do that is receive the grace we are given, share the grace we are given, and then sit back and be around each other's lives and celebrate how much more like Christ we have become. And this, everyday, ordinary living, in the grace that was given us. For it was grace, by grace, that you have been saved through faith. It was by grace that you have been saved through faith. Through no works of your own, it's not of yourselves. It was a free gift from God, so that none of us would boast. My friends, the gospel hangs in the air before you. What do you do now? What do you do now? My invitation is singular. Come to the cross. I don't care if you're a Christian, come to the cross and give back to God what he died to redeem you from, your sin, and receive from God the grace that is afforded you, not because you're a good person, but because he loves you. Come to the cross. If you've never accepted Christ, I want to challenge you today. Don't leave this place without becoming a Christian. You think, does anybody do that? About four or five times over the last two weeks, people have. It never ceases to amaze me. People come up and give their lives to Jesus, and it starts for them a new life in him grace. If you've been a Christian all your life, but it's been a long time since you've confessed, come to the cross and receive the grace for being someone who has given so lavish a gift of salvation only to turn away from it. God hasn't turned away from you. Come to the cross and experience the amazing, beautiful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are and the way you've called us upwards and outwards. God, in Mephibosheth and the woman caught in sin, we, we can see that we are called beyond our heredity of sin. We are called beyond our willful choices of sin. We are called to see the possibility of life in the grace of God. So may your grace find us today. May you remind us that it was every sin in our life that you have forgiven. And may you empower us to live graciously, humbly, and ever mindful of all that you forgave that we might know you. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for breaking through and redeeming the best of us and the worst of us. Today we come as a people to a moment of grace. We just ask that you would give us the courage to reach out and grab on. In Jesus' name, amen. I think what I love about Nemo is that everybody around him was talking about it. Would you do it? Wouldn't you do it? One was saying, don't do it and freaking out. He was brave and he swam out into the unknown and to great risk and great peril to touch this thing out there that, that he didn't know what it was. For many Christians, we know religious behavior, but we don't know what grace is. And I'm going to encourage you today. I want you to swim out. I want you to take great risk and have great courage and swim out and grab onto that one thing that can save your soul, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, him and him alone. And live in the grace afforded to you by him to be used according to his purposes. We're going to lean into that topic and discuss it more in our sermon-based small groups this coming week. And those are the kind of conversations you're going to have. And so I invite you, as the church, if you don't know Jesus Christ, make no time wasted in getting down here after the service and let's pray. Let's come to him who in himself is our all-sufficient redemption. If you've broken yourself and you've made mistakes and you're in willful sin, even though you know you're a Christian, come down. I'll pray confession with you. I do it all the time. I, I do it in front of you. Let's just do this together. Let's live in the grace given us in Christ. It is the only badge that the world will look at and say, I want some of that. Because it's not us performing, it's us receiving what they need to. My friends, as you go through this week,
We are turning into the final part of this um, devotion. And I'm going to invite you to grab one of these devotion packets or go online and get them this week and do them with your family, do them alone, as couples. It's up to you. But really make use of these. They're out every week, and we'd love to have you in them because it will draw you closer into the Word of God that allows you to know not only the language God speaks, but what He's calling His church to. My friends, as you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and give you His peace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, the grace-filled church must leave the building. My friends, you are dismissed.